Well, I don't welcome everyone this morning. Uh, Resurrection Sunday, you've already did that. But also, let's give a hand to those that are in youth building next door. Amen. Amen. So glad that they're over there. So glad that you guys are connecting with us and, and those that gave up their seats in here to, to make room for other people. Amen. And this might be a thing as we, as we grow as a church. It's something we might have to do on a continual basis. Amen. I mean, I believe just the power of God can flow in there just as well as it can flow in here. I mean, after all, there's services that, that I, I, I'm not able to be here, but I've watched online, and I'm telling you, God ministers directly through that. Of course, it's always better when you're around the body, right? Yes. And, and so anyway, we're excited about what God's doing here at Heritage, and, and so grateful for all the conversations that you're having. You know, I think we're over a thousand conversations just in just in a just in a in a matter of seven weeks. You've already had a thousand conversations, and our goal this year is six thousand God conversations. Amen, amen. We are to be the the, the we are the light of the we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth, and and therefore, when we go outside these walls, we are to influence someone else's life. Are you are you grateful for what God's done in your life? Are you grateful for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I am grateful for the gospel. Where will we be without Jesus? Where will we be without King Jesus? Where will we be without his sacrifice? Where will we be without what the stripes that were laid upon his back? Where will we be for the fact that he, that he took crown, a crown of thorns upon his head and, and, and was spit on, was beat upon, was, was nailed to a cross for you and me? Where will we be without that today? The gospel, the gospel. Let's look at Romans chapter five as we get into this morning. My title this morning is From the Cross to the Throne. What happened from the cross to the throne? And this is, um, I mean, there's so much in this, in the word. We're gonna dive right into this. And, and, uh, and I was like, Lord, you need to help me to, to get out what you wanna get out because this could be like a, like a five-week message, but, uh, but Lord, help me, Holy Spirit, help me to deposit in our hearts what we need to receive today, amen? I, I don't know about you, but I always need to come to the house ready to receive. How about you? Amen, I'm expecting to receive something that will cause me to experience progression, advancement, promotion, and my highest expectation fulfilled. Can I get an amen? And in Romans chapter five, Verse six, it says, for when we were still without strength, we were without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. If you're a good man, someone might even die for that person because they're good. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still, say still, still. sinners, say sinners. sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Can we praise God for that? Amen. <laughs> while we were still sinners. Amen. It, it doesn't, it, it, it didn't, it didn't matter in the midst of where we were in our walk with God. You always look back that while you were still sinning, it doesn't change the fact that he still died for you. He still came and he took the sin, he took the torment on him so we didn't have to, amen? Amen? amen. Go to Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three, say thank God for the word. You say, well, pastor, you sure have us repeat a lot of stuff after you because, because what you need to understand is, is you need to understand how important the word is. Amen? You need to understand it because that's when we release our faith is when we, we believe in our heart and we speak it out of our mouth. And, and uh, we'll get here into Ephesians 3 in just a moment. But the gospel. Romans 1 tells us that the gospel is the power, is the power. You know, it doesn't say it's a, a power because if it was a power, then there could be more power but it says it is the power. Hallelujah. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. So the gospel leads to something. It leads to salvation, which better translated is victory. So the gospel leads to, you could say, change. It, you could say healing. 
A better translated in the Greek is soteria, which means prosperity, and it means complete and total peace. So the gospel leads to something. So if I'm receiving the gospel, whether whatever that word might be on a Sunday morning is to take me somewhere, is to take me from where I am to where I need to be, because that is what the power of the gospel has the ability and the capacity to accomplish in our lives, right? So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. And it says, therein, the righteousness of God is revealed, leading from faith to faith, and the just shall live by faith, the gospel. The gospel. If we go back to the very beginning, like I said, there's a lot here we could, we could talk about this morning. There's a lot I could share about the gospel, but the root of the gospel is understanding this, that you and I were made in God's likeness. A better way to say that, we're exact duplication in kind. Exact duplication in kind. So if you want to see what God looks like from a physical standpoint, you have to look at each one of us. And you're like, really? Now you understand God is a spirit. He doesn't, he's not flesh like you and I are. But yet we want to say, because the Bible explains that he measured, he measured the, 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 the oceans, he measured the waters from the span of his hand. So, so there's a lot of things in scripture that comp- compares. It talks about the head. It talks about his eyes. It talks about certain things comparing his characteristics. But it said we were made in his image. So when, when God formed man out of the dust of the ground, That process was him making a human body. He was making a human body. But when he breathed the breath of life into him, he became a now a human being. He became a being, not just a human body. He became something that had something else in it besides just a shell of a human body. He also now became something that is spirit and has a soul. It has the ability to make decisions. It has the ability to make choices. And, and, and it said that, that Adam and Eve, when they were created, were, were clothed with glory and honor. And they, they were clothed, but, when, but yet when, when the enemy deceived Adam and Eve, deceived Eve, it said they became and they saw themselves as naked. What happened? It said they lost their God-likeness from the standpoint of the glory and the honor. Now they had a body and now they had a soul, but their spirit became dead. This is the gospel. And when that took place, God said, I can't, I, I can't allow my greatest treasure, I can't allow something that is a part of me, something that I created, something that I love so much to be lost forever. God had to step in and he had to set parameters in place. And immediately we see in Genesis 3.15, it says that God said, and he cursed Satan and said, on your belly you will crawl and said, there's one coming. Say one coming. There's one coming and you are going to bruise his, he's going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. Meaning there is one coming. There's someone coming that is going to put his foot on your neck and he's going to do something about everything that you just did. Now you may ask, well, well, if God is God, then then why didn't God just, just do something about what happened? He couldn't. You're like, God couldn't do something? No. Because he had given man authority and dominion over the earth. And when Adam and Eve fell, it wasn't just becoming spiritually dead, but they gave up the authority and dominion that they had in the earth. God couldn't just scrap it and let's start over. Why? Because God no longer had authority to do it because now now Satan now had authority over this world. So, So God couldn't all of a sudden now make another body. Why? Because God didn't own the ground anymore. He didn't own the dust anymore because because he had given it to man. Some of you are like, what? 
God had to do things legally. If God tried to do something illegally, then he would end up just like Satan did. God had to do it legally. Our redemption is a legal redemption. Man was the key to the fall. So therefore, a man was going to have to be the key to redemption. God was going to have to do it through a man. God was going to have to do it through a man. So all through time, all throughout the Old Testament, we see Satan. He's like, he's like, well, who is this one? Who is this one that's coming? Who is this one that's coming? Now, let's look at here in Ephesians 3. Thank you. Verse 9 says, actually, let's go to verse 8. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And, so I'm preaching the acceptable riches of Christ, and what? To make all see. So he wants everyone to see something. He wants everyone to see the, the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of, of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden, hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church, get this, to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, now get this, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. So this is a mystery. There was a mystery here. So here, Satan didn't know what this mystery was. There's this one that's coming, and, 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 and Satan doesn't know who this one is. And, and all through time, he's looking, is it this one? Maybe he was thinking when, when all of a sudden he, he heard God speak to Abel and said he was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. That all of a sudden he goes, wait a minute, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get with Cain. Because even, even the, in the writings in, in, in Genesis 4, it tells us, and God tells Cain, hey, Cain, you've got to master this. He says, Satan is sitting at the door and you've got to master this. So what was he, what was he saying? He, the enemy was at work. Why? Because he didn't want to, the one that was going to come to bruise his head coming to manifestation. So he took out Abel because he knew God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. You can look throughout Genesis and we get to a point in, in Genesis 6 just in a short time where it says every thought of humanity was evil continually. I mean, we can look throughout, throughout all, all the different things. We, we look at the children of Israel labeled as God's people, covenant people. And it said in Exodus, it says that the children of Israel became greater than the Egyptians. And what happens? The enemy whispers into Pharaoh and says, hey, hey, they're becoming greater than you. And maybe there's someone in this people that's gonna take, be the one that's gonna take you out. And so he whispers in, in Pharaoh's ear and says, hey, you need to kill every male that's born. Then we get to a time where you have the, you have the judges and you have someone like a Samson come out. And, and all of a sudden, maybe Samson's the one. He's the one that's strong. And so what happens? Samson gets deceived and, and they take his eyes out. Maybe it's one of the other judges. Maybe, oh, oh okay, the Israel, God didn't want Israel to have a king. But yet they cried out for a king and God gave them a king. And they're like, oh, maybe, then maybe Satan's on the outside looking at this and saying, oh, there's this, this king and oh, King Saul. And so what happened? King Saul falls into pride. He tries to, he becomes a people pleaser. And what, what does that happen? It's the enemy at work. Why? Trying to take out the one that was meant to destroy him. Then all of a sudden, Saul loses the anointing and you get to David. Now you have King David and he's the one that kills the Philistine. And maybe Satan's thinking, oh man, this one, he killed that Philistine. Maybe he's the one that's gonna bruise my head. And all of a sudden now you have King Saul trying to kill David. 
Then all of a sudden, the enemy tries another way. Maybe it's still this David. So, so he, gets, he gets David to fall into sin and he, and, and, and he, he commits adultery and he murders someone. And, and, and then all of a sudden, something happens with, with his family and Absalom. And, and these things happen and all of a sudden, David can't build the temple. But then you have Solomon and Solomon was the wisest man. But yet, one of, the, one of the things that we were told is don't welcome foreign gods into your kingdom. And so what happened? His kingdom ended up falling, so Solomon couldn't be the one. You have, you have Isaiah that steps up as a prophet, speak on behalf of God, but, but all of a sudden you have a, you have a king that comes across and saws him in half. Isaiah saw, died by being sawed in half. Jeremiah, maybe it's Jeremiah. He's the weeping prophet, so maybe, maybe it's him, but... Well, he has him stoned. Amos, Nahum, all of them end up getting killed by a king. But then, who's this? There's no one coming for 400 and some years. There's no prophet. There's no speaking prophet in the earth. But who, so who could be this one? Who could be the one, Vic? And it wasn't until Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, and all of a sudden, he comes up out of the water, and there's a voice that comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And what happened immediately? Jesus goes in the wilderness, and what happened? Jesus is tempted for 40 days. He's tempted for 40 days, but it wasn't until after the 40 days that actually Satan came to him in person. And tempted him. And he says, if you do this, I'll give you this. And you say, oh, well, it, it, it wasn't really a temptation. Yes, it was. If it wasn't a temptation, then, then if Jesus knew that Satan didn't have authority over the earth, then it wouldn't have been a temptation to Jesus. Jesus said, oh, well, that's not yours. No, Jesus knew it was his. Because Satan is the God of this world. Jesus was tempted in all points yet without sin. Fully man, yet fully God. He came up the legal way for our legal redemption. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us, if the rulers of, had known, if the rulers had known. You see, you see, Satan's mode of operation throughout time was what? Stealing, killing, and destroying. We see it through every great man or woman of God that stepped up through the ages, stealing, killing, and destroying. Stealing, killing, and destroying. Why? Because he didn't want the one to come that was gonna bruise his head. And so God played right into his mode of operation, stealing, killing, and destroying. Because the only way, the only way that man was gonna be redeemed if someone died on their behalf. And so Satan just, he couldn't, he had such a lust for power. He, he, and, and so right now, because I got to kill that man. But the re very reason he killed him was really the reason that we got redeemed. The redemption from the cross to the throne. Go to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Say, thank you for resurrection. Thank you, Father. Galatians 4. Hallelujah. Verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements, the elements, the elements of the world. When we were bond under the elements, we were in bondage under the elements of this world, but when, but when, so there was a time when we were under the bondage of the elements, but when, I'm so glad for but whens, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, that's the man part, born under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Let's go to chapter three. So much here this morning. 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentile in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So in the fullness of time, when, what's the fullness of time? The fullness of time is when God said there's one coming. So Galatians 4 says in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He became, he became our, see, we were cursed. We were cursed in the garden. But yet Jesus became that curse for you and me. He took the curse upon himself. If you're born again, don't ever say one day uh, that, that you are cursed by something. Uh, you need to know that because of Jesus, he took on every curse for me. And it said, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That, Paul wasn't the first person to write that. That was written in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Declaring and describing how we would be redeemed. You know, growing up and in, in listening to Easter messages and hearing about resurrection services and, you know, I always heard about the cross and I heard about the grave. And, and even when it came to the cross, I don't think I really understood the fullness of what took place at the cross. I think we can mentally assent to things because we've heard them over and over. Oh, oh, well, Jesus went to the cross. And we can get to a place where it sounds like it's an easy thing. Oh, well, he just went, you know, well, Jesus went to the cross. Go to John chapter 19. What fully happened in those three days? Matthew 12 tells us just as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and nights, Jesus says, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? So three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we've talked about the, we talk about the, the betrayal. We talk about the, the stripes are related upon his back and, and, we, we can, and we can talk about the cross. But what happened for three days and three nights. What was the, the fullness of what took place on this? Passover. This thing that came to redeem us and destroy the works of the enemy. First John says that the reason Satan came was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. John chapter 19, let's look in verse 28. After this, so John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled and said, I thirst. I thirst. I thirst. So Jesus is saying, I lack something. Just hold your place there. Let's go to, let's go to Psalms 22. Psalms 22. Jesus said, I thirst. So when Jesus on the cross, it wasn't a light, it wasn't an easy thing. And, and I wanna, give a, I wanna get, deposit a picture on the inside of us. There was torment in the cross. The cross was about tormenting someone. He's being hung, possibly naked with no clothes on and everyone staring at him, everyone looking at him, but yet his arms are spread wide and his, nail, his feet are nailed to a cross. And if you're naked, then a lot of the immediate things you'd wanna do is what, cover yourself. But here we have Jesus, he can't cover himself. The torment, the embarrassment, everyone looking on him, the weight of the world on him, the weight of humanity on him. Psalms 22, and there, we could read this whole chapter, but, but uh, if we, we start in verse 12, it says, many bulls have surrounded me. And this speaks of, this word bulls here is not talking about physical animals. It's speaking of demonic, demonic voices, demonic attacks. 
Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. This is what's going on on the inside of Jesus. He's got, he's got all of, all of the, 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 the demonic realm coming against him, attacking him mentally, attacking him in every way he's being attacked, mentally, physically, in every way. He goes, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws and you have brought me to the dust of death. What is that? He goes, what is he? He said, I thirst, remember? But what are we saying? He's saying, he goes, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. What does that mean? It means a, it means a precious vase that used to be filled with something that would supply to other people. He said, all of a sudden then now, that pottery is smashed on the ground and all it is is now some, nothing but shards. And that's why Jesus is saying, I thirst. I thirst. I used to be something and someone that was filled with something that other people needed, but now I don't have anything left. I've been poured out. There's nothing in me. Jesus is in torment. I thirst. If you, look at, if you look at Matthew 27, he goes, he goes, Lord, he goes, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me helpless? You've left me helpless. This, that's torment. When you don't have anyone and you're alone, that is a helpless feeling. And that's what the Savior on the cross was feeling. This was not a flippant thing by just going to the cross and just stretching his hands out. And, and no, this was something that was torment. So it doesn't matter. I want you to know if you're tormented right now, you need to know that Jesus' tor torment far outweighs any torment you could ever experience. He bore the torment for you. He, do he, he bore the loneliness for you. He, he bore the rejection for you. He bo it bore the embarrassment for you. Verse 16 says, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can't count, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They drive my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. He could count his bones. How could he do that? Because they had ripped the side of his flesh off with that whip that had glass and that had, had metal in it and it just ripped his side. He could see his bones. You could see his bones and there he is hanging on the tree in this torment. And in John 19, he, verse 30, he says, so when Jesus had received, had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus said, you know what? No man can take my life from me. He goes, I lay it down. It was on his terms. I mean, try, Satan tried to take him out so many times. Even after he was tempted, he came out anointed. He, 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 he does amazing things. They try to stone him. They try to, Satan tried to take him out, so, throw him off a cliff, tried to take him out so many times. But Jesus said, no man can take my life from me. I lay it down. He went up on that cross willingly for you and me. He went on up that cross so we didn't have to. He said, it is finished. You could say it is finished. The, the law is finished. You could say the sacrifice is finished. He, he, he did this and it was three o'clock in the afternoon. It was the same time on, in the Jewish tradition where the high priest would come out at three o'clock in the afternoon and say the lamb, the lamb without blemish, the lamb without spot. He goes, it is finished. It is finished. In their time, they're like, they're like oh, well, it, it, it's the sins are, sins are taken away for one more year. Sins are taken away for one more year. But I'm telling you, when Jesus did it, when he said it was finished, it, it was sacrifices are finished of all time. It is once for a man to die. Once for a man to die. The torment of the cross, when it was finished, but if he, but yet, but yet there was a part of it that still needed to be accomplished. Because see, in my mind, it was like, oh, you had the cross and then three days later, Jesus got up. But what happened? What happened in that time frame? What, what took place in that time frame? What took place? 
Let me just say this, and we'll read some scriptures, but understand that if Jesus didn't go to hell, we would have to. Jesus had to go to hell for you and for me. Some people debate that. Some people don't even understand that. That Jesus went into Satan's domain and, and defeated him on his territory. And we'll read a little bit later, but Acts chapter 2 tells us it said he had to raise up because it could not hold him any longer. That Jesus had to, Jesus had to take, he had to take on our sin. He had to take on our transgressions. He had to take everything on him. He took the wrath of God on him so we didn't have to take on the wrath of God. You say, would Jesus really take it on? Yeah, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it said he, 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 was, he said he was manifested in the flesh and he was justified in the spirit. You see, if justified in the spirit, that means, that means that once he had to come to a point where he wasn't justified. That means he had to come to a point where he had taken on our unrighteousness. But yet he became justified in the spirit. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Just thank you, Lord. Just the torment of hell. The torment of hell. Romans 1.16 tells, explains this. Sorrow of death surrounds me Pains, pains, pains of Sheol, the place of the dead. Hold me in distress. Hold me. What makes hell hell is you can't do what you want to do. What makes hell hell is not the fact that it's hot. The fact is, is God's not there. Hell was not made for mankind. The Bible tells us that hell was made for Satan and his angels. He said, this is Jesus, this is talking to Jesus. He goes, the pains, Nikki, the pains of Sheol hold me tight. This, this, This was the torment of hell. Psalms 88, six through eight, explain this. You have put me in the lowest pit and your wrath lies heavy upon me. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. This is speaking of what the coming Messiah would experience for us. So there was a torment at the cross and there was a torment in hell. And there's other scriptures we could go to, but for the sake of time. In that process of time, I, I don't know exactly what period in that three-day period of time at when it took place. I'm not sure what day, but there was something that started to happen because Acts tells us that hell could hold him no longer. Something took place. Something took place. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Romans 6 Verse four explains it like this. It tells us that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of God. Romans eight, verse 11, it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens our mortal bodies. So what happened is the spirit of God went in to hell, went into that place of torment and raised Jesus up. And in one one of the Psalms it says, and you loosed my bonds. The Spirit of God went into there. Psalms 116, I believe it says, and you loosed my bonds. When the Spirit of God went into hell and went into Sheol and went into the lower parts of the earth, it said that you loosed my bonds. And the glory of God came into hell and raised Jesus up. So where he was tormented and distressed, where wrath was heavy upon him, it broke off of him because it could not hold him any longer. But you know what? Jesus didn't just all of a sudden raise up at that moment. He had an assignment. He had an assignment. Hallelujah. He had an assignment. Woo. (laughs) Say, Say Jesus had an assignment in hell. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. 
Praise you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Father. Let's go to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Mm, that's it. I don't want her to leave anything out in this part. Hallelujah. The Word. The Word is alive. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. So he was put to death in the flesh, but what happened? He was made alive by the Spirit. So when he went to hell, he was died, but what happened? He was made alive by the Spirit. By whom also he went and he preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. So those that had been lost in the days of Noah, Jesus went there and he preached the gospel to them. Look at Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 27. Becky, can you put up verse 51 and 53 for me? If you have another hand, turn to, for the audience here, turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. All right, to teach a little bit here. Ephesians 4. So look, look, at, look at Matthew 27, verse 51. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Verse 8. Thank you, Father. But to each one of us, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Are you grateful for Christ's gift? Therefore, he says, now get this, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first, say first, first. descended into the lower parts of the earth, that he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all, he all heavens, that he might fill all things. Woo! Hallelujah. So you can't say he ascended, but you got to first understand he first descended into the lower parts of the earth and he came out of hell and he carried and he carried and he preached the gospel. The King James says he carried captivity captive, meaning those that were in prison in hell, he said, come on guys, we're coming out. Come on guys, we're coming out. Come on, guys, we're coming out. Those that were captive, he led captivity, meaning now, now you're with me and you're no longer with him. You're coming with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. So when he went to hell, it wasn't, it wasn't just experiencing hell, but the Spirit of God raised him up. He stood there and he preached the gospel to who he was and why he came, and he led everyone that would believe came out with him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, came out with him. Go to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. We do have an awesome God. See, you get, see, you get a better picture of what our salvation is all about. And what Jesus took on himself. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Mm. Look at verse 11. This explains it as well. In him, you were also circumcised. Not in yourself, in him. So in him, in Christ, you also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now get this. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
now get this, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. See, he raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. He nailed it to the cross. Hallelujah. God raised him up. He nailed it to the cross and he, he triumphed in it. That in the midst of hell, he triumphed in hell. Wow. Hallelujah. 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 Having disarmed, he disarmed principality. He disarmed Satan. Yeah. He spoiled Satan. He put off everything that Satan has done to man and put upon man. We are no longer subject to the curse of this world, but now we, are, we have a right to the blessing of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Having disarmed principalities and power, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. He came, be, came to be victorious. He went into hell, yes. weak and tormented, but he came out victorious. Yes. Hall he went in weak. He went in defeated. He went in tormented. He went in with the sins of the world upon him, but he came out victorious. He came out triumphant. And he took, according to Revelation chapter 1, 15 through 18, that he was dead and now is alive, and he has the keys of death and hell with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he says he's alive forevermore. That's what my Jesus did. That's what happened in three days and three nights. Hallelujah. 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 Man, John 20, you don't need to turn there, but you know, it's that first day of the week. Mary goes to the, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She has an encounter with what she thinks is a gardener, but yet is Jesus. This is early Sunday morning. Early Sunday morning. She comes and, and she sees him, and, and, and all of a sudden she sees him, and she wants to hug him, but, 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 but what does Jesus say? He says, don't handle me, don't touch me, because why? I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Why? Because something that needed to be done in these three days and three nights hadn't been accomplished yet. He said, don't handle me. I haven't ascended to the Father. All of a sudden, later in, in the same chapter, you see Jesus showing up. Later that day, he shows up. That's the morning. Later in the day, he shows up. And 10 of the disciples are there. And Jesus says, peace be to you. See, peace be to you. Peace be to you. Because something happened from the morning to that afternoon. It actually said evening. Something happened in the morning, but Jesus said, don't touch me. Something happened. And it could have been that day. Maybe, maybe it was later on in there because Thomas wasn't there because it tells us eight days later. Eight days later, Thomas is now there. Jesus shows up, and what does he say? Touch me. Handle me. Put your hand in my side. Put your hands in the scars in my, in my hands. Touch me. So what took place? Something had to happen because what Jesus came to do wasn't totally fulfilled yet. What happened? Without going there for the sake of time, write down Hebrews chapter 9. And it says that there's, there's a heavenly and there's an earthly. And just as there was an earthly tabernacle and there was some things that the high priest had to do from a natural standpoint, it says that actually the heavenly is more real. And yet we think this is more real, but the heavenly is more real. And I believe what took place is that after he saw, saw Mary and said, and said, don't handle me, Jesus went into the very throne room of heaven. He went into the very throne room of God and he took his blood and he poured it on the mercy seat. He poured it on the mercy seat because what happened? That then caused everything to now in the covenant to be totally ratified and totally completed that now we have now obtained mercy. 
Hallelujah. So when God looks at you and me today, he doesn't see us in the way, we're, in the way we were. Why? Because he took on all our iniquities. And so how he sees humanity now is he sees us through the mercy of God, which is the blood of Jesus. He sees us through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And that blood cried out mercy. And so when he went to heaven and said, he poured out and said, mercy. Mercy. Are you grateful for mercy today? Hallelujah. Are you grateful for mercy today? Hallelujah. You have time for two more scriptures. Hallelujah. Go to Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two. So now we know what happened from the cross to the throne. Yeah. Hallelujah. Man, if we get a hold, this becomes a revelation. It changes how you pray. It changes how you operate and walk in your authority. It changes the fact that you know who you are in Jesus and who your identity is in him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter two. This whole chapter is so good. But let's, uh, for the sake of time, let's start in verse 10 because there's a title on top of mine and, and it says this, bringing many sons to glory. <laughs> Woo! Verse 10, for it was fitting for him, talking to Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will pray, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I in the children whom God has given me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Mm, thank you, Lord. See, this is first written in Psalms 22, which is a messianic psalm where Jesus talked about dying on the cross. But at the same time, he, he tells us this, that even though I died and I'm dying, I will declare your name to my brethren. Where did he declare that name to, to his brethren? In hell? Where is he going to declare that name to the disciples? I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. I will put trust in him. Here am I, the children whom God has given me. Insomuch then as the children have partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. So Jesus took on flesh and blood. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seeds of Abraham. Woo! Hallelujah. Therefore, in all things, he be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those that are being tempted. Wow. How, he doesn't help angels. What happened? He came down and he, he, he pulled us up on his level. He pulled us up on his level. Amen. Let's close with this. Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Thank you, Father. This was the first message ever preached when the Holy Spirit came. This was the first message that established the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before I read that, I, I, I want to read this scripture real quick because this confirms also another prophecy about Jesus preaching in hell. Just make note of Psalms 88, 9 through 11. He says, Lord, I have called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands to you. Now get this. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Now get this. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? It's prophesying that Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to preach in the place of the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Look at Acts. This was the first message that was preached. Acts chapter 2, 22. 
Thank you, Father. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, him being delivered, he deli being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Having taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by them, for David said concerning him. And then he goes and he reads uh, something from the book of Psalms. Let's go to verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is, born, he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Jesus that his soul was not left in hell. That his soul was not left in hell, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out that which you now see and hear, for David did not ascend into heaven, but he says to himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Talk prophesying of Jesus till I make your enemies your footstool. That's the fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis 3. And it says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I want you to know today that when Jesus ascended on high after, after he, had, he had come down and he was seen by over 500 people, that he ascended to the throne of God, he sat down, and right now he's on the throne of God, daily interceding for us. And therefore, he is now my Lord and he's my Christ. Yeah. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. He's my Lord, and he's my Christ. <coughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. What, what a redemption plan. What a plan of redemption. Have you seen this morning redemption in a new light? What happened from the cross to the throne? Wow. Calls it a great salvation. Mm. You can't do life without him. You can't do life apart from him. You can't get to heaven based on your good works. Amen. If it was just, if it was just someone dying physically, physical body dying, then a prophet could have died for us. Really? If it was just about a physical death, then Abel could have been a just sacrifice. But we needed someone that was actually gonna die spirit, soul, spirit and body and be tormented in their soul. Good works is not what gets you to heaven. The only way to heaven is through what Jesus did for us those three days and those three nights. And he took the wrath on him. You know that what lets me know, and it was hard for me to receive this, is God is not mad at me. He's not mad at you. Now, there's things that we do could displease, not so much because of, it's because he, he sees there's a much better life. There, there's a much better way of living. He's not mad at you. The enemy is the one that would want to remind you of your past. The enemy is the one that wants to convince you that you're not good enough. The enemy wants to do that. Because why? The blood of Jesus is still crying today and it's saying mercy. It's saying mercy. Now I have to be honest with you. 
family. Jesus is returning. You need to know that Jesus doesn't send anyone to hell. The only way to go to hell is when we reject his sacrifice and we reject what he accomplished for us. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. Another mistake I often made was receiving Jesus into my life and trying to maintain, maintain salvation on my own. It's amazing how how we come to Jesus and we receive forgiveness and we accept that sacrifice, but all of a sudden when we fall away from God that somehow we feel like we can now earn it. The only way of earning it is receiving what he did. He's interceding for you today. He's not looking over you with judgment today. He's looking over you with mercy, saying, come, lay your life down. Jesus laid his life down for you. He's saying, just bring your life to me. Bring your life to me. You don't need to try to figure it out. You don't have to have it all together. Just, just give me something to work with. Just, just start here at point A and just receive me and let me come on the inside of you and make you a new creation. And then Jesus, before he went back to heaven, he said, hey, go to Jerusalem until you're in due with power from the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus knew that we couldn't do it without the enablement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You've heard me say this before, that grace is not the band-aid for your sin, that grace is the ability to cause you to live in a way that you couldn't live by yourself. Grace is not the band-aid to your sin. Grace is the power to live holy. Grace is not the thing to say, hey, I can go ahead and just continue to live any way I want. No, grace it gives me the ability to empower to live just like Jesus lived when he walked the earth. Hallelujah. So I'm telling you, Jesus has given us everything. He gave us his life. He gave us redemption. He gave us mercy. He gave us love. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the grace of God. So you have, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, on the inside of you, everything you need to live as victorious sons and daughters of God. Healing is not something you earn. It's something that he purchased in the covenant. And do you realize that the covenant was effective before Jesus ever came and still healing was in the first covenant? Do you know that? Healing was in the first covenant. And Jesus told us that, or Hebrews tells us that we have a better covenant established upon better promises. So if there was healing in the first covenant, and yet we have a better covenant. There's so much we have access to. And just bow your heads for a moment. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Justin, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I've never heard some of this stuff that you talked about today, but I, I sense something happening on the inside of my heart today. I sense something here. I don't know what it is. But I want, I want this life. I want this life. That's why no one's looking around. Just if that's you and you want that kind of life, just slip your hand up right where you are. I'm looking around. See that hand? See that hand? Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Justin, I, 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 I've been that person where I, yeah, I made Jesus the Lord of my life, but I, I try to do it in my own ability, my own strength.
and I constantly have this thought I've got to earn or I'm not good enough. But you want to say, Pastor Justin, I, I, want, to, I want to know that I'm good enough today. I, I, I want to, I've, I've been away from God, but I, I want to come back to God today and, and not go backwards. But I want to go forwards and progress what God has for me in this next season of my life. If that's you, just slip your hand up right where you are. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Father, we praise you, love you. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for such a great salvation. Thank you for the gospel and the plan of salvation that you had from the very beginning. I see it today. And because I can see it, I have faith for it. I receive what Jesus did for me. It is sufficient. Thank you, Lord, that he took hell for me. He took torment for me. But most importantly, Lord, he was raised for me. And he took his blood and put, poured it on the mercy seat. I stand here today forgiven and holy because that's what I've been made. I'm forgiven. Old things are passed away and all things become new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you receive that today, give him a shout of praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer today, I want to encourage you. If you could email us at testimonies at heritagefaith.com, and we'd like to contact you. If you want to, even before you leave today, Joseph will be up here, and you need want more information about what are the next steps. I want somebody to pray with me. What are the next steps? What do I need to do? And, and I, I don't know any of this church stuff. I'm not even sure half of what's going on, but I know something's happening in me. And if that's you today, just come up and see Joseph and after the service. And we wanna know that, that you were ministered today and that God did something in your heart today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. And know this, that in Jesus that in Christ, he always leads us in triumph. You're triumphant because of what Jesus did. Do you believe that? Yeah. Give him a shout of praise, amen. Yeah. Hallelujah.